Once again, for the second time in the year, I would like to wish everybody who celebrates a happy or merry top of the table at Christmas. This is the Arsenal Vision Postmatch Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Black Man's Twitter, Yank Gunner. Happy top of the table at Christmas. And I guess I should also say a very happy slash merry Christmas to those of you who celebrate. And um, from my family to your family, from all of our families to your families, we wish you the best. Um, if this is a difficult time of year, wish you love and support. Um, and good things, and hopefully Arsenal being top of the table is one of those good things that can help buoy you at this at this time of year. And if you are uh, looking forward to to a lovely time, hopefully a happy and and peaceful time, then we're happy to hear that for you. I do want to mention that um, unfortunately there's been a loss in Paul's family, and I know that he's struggling with that. Um, and it's it's been a difficult time, and for that to happen this time of the year, as anyone who's gone through that knows, just a, a, a terrible thing to have to deal with. So we certainly have our thoughts and our love out to, to Paul and his family and his wife, um, you know, and to anyone going through something similar. So of course, Paul will continue to be here on the podcast, but for the time being, uh, dealing with family as he, he rightfully should. So we have a very big game to dissect, a very interesting performance and a, I think, very satisfactory result that does leave us top of the table at Christmas and a couple of days off, which at this time of year, you will absolutely take it. I'm sure Mikel Arteta is thrilled to pieces about that. So we'll talk about all that. And here to do it with me today, just a quiet chat with the man himself, Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. And um, well said on Paul. And Paul, thinking of your brother, take care, mate. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, I'd like to start, Clive. I'd just like to start with, now that you've had a night to sleep on it, how you feel about that one? I mean, Tim has said this. I think we've talked about it before. This is the game we wanted to be involved in a couple seasons ago when City and Liverpool were doing this every every season, twice a season. And I said to you before we started recording, I think right now the two hardest fixtures in world football are at Anfield and at the Etihad, with the exception, of course, of at the Emirates, I should add. But yeah. those are the two hardest fixtures in world football. That's where you have to bring the highest level, and that's where you are most likely to face a, a unique test. So I'm just curious, with a night to sleep on it now and the emotion of, of the jeopardy out of it, how are you feeling about the standard of football that was played and, and our ability to be up to the task? Yeah, I love these games. And I'll probably just add on while the listener is now shouting, what about the bird of Al? What about Bayern Munich? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, better just yeah. caveat it, Elliot. <laughs> we, we may find out, Clive. We may find that out uh, in, in April or May. So no, but you, you you are right. If you, you add those two, we, that's, those are the places where you, you don't want to go, right? So... Um, so yeah, we were talking, weren't we, about these games and the emotions that they bring out. I, I love these games. I, I don't love how I felt. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, "Oh, I really enjoyed that," because I didn't. Because it, the outcome was very important. It was important to me. I'd made it important. I'd made this game in my mind, rightly or wrongly, as a measuring stick to how far we've progressed. And and I think it may have turned out a little bit like that. Because one of the things that I may have a weakness for, I'm always worried about our perception in either the media or other clubs or other teams. And I think, no, you're not seeing us right, not seeing us right. And then when we suddenly fall away and don't hit the top four, we don't make the <laughs> win the league, I think, damn it, they might have been right. But I do think we're growing. Our respect level is growing, sorry. And we are taking it as a much more serious team. And it's quite interesting. And the outcome is not everything. Because we got a draw last year here, didn't we, at Anfield? We get a draw this year, and the respect for our team is much bigger than it was last year. And that's interesting, isn't it, for the same amount of points that we take away? Yeah, I think it's always interesting to hear the reaction of the coaches, independent of one another, mm. to the game. Because usually the first thing they say about a game gives you a sense of how they how they saw it, right? Mm. Klopp's seen a lot in football. Mikel's seen quite a bit already and certainly saw a lot with City. Klopp's reaction, first thing in, in his press conference, wow, first of all, he said to Mikel, right? As mm. they hugged on the touchline, wow. First thing he says, I saw top teams. That's what I saw. I saw two, I just saw two really good football teams, a really good game, super intense. Um, and then if you look at Mikel's comments, the first comment on his main um, press conference. It was an unbelievable game of football, one of the most intense and hectic games that I've witnessed in 20 years. The quality, the intentions of both teams, it was superb to watch it. And we as a team, with the boys willing to play at that level, to have the courage to play at that level, the determination and belief to do what we've done here, I think my players deserve big credit. 
You know, it's interesting, Clive. I think one of the ways we can view this game, and we'll get into the moments and we'll get into mm-hmm. the individual performances. We've got time, just the two of us together today. I think an interesting way to talk about this or to, to get into the discussion about this game is to compare it against last season's game at the at, at yeah. Anfield. A weaker Liverpool, certainly at that time, but a Liverpool that was coming back, that was still strong. And that game was actually, I think, very representative of who Arsenal was. We weren't a full-strength Arsenal, but we came out of the blocks racing at them, hit them on the counter, executed brilliantly to get two goals. Then we couldn't hold up in terms of our control and domination of a game. They were able to pin us back and put us under immense pressure, and we needed our keeper to salvage a point. Whereas this season, I think we executed relatively poorly in the attacking third due to performances we may come on to, but much more control over the game. Not in all phases, not in every moment, but very rarely did Liverpool pin us back. And if you look at it, you could say there's the Trent Alexander-Arnold chance where he should score, of course. Yeah, yeah. There's the Salah moment of individual brilliance. There's not much else. This is a game that I think demonstrated versus last season, Clive, where we've evolved as a team in that we have the ability to really restrict what the opposition team does. And if you look at this game, you know, I'll use FB ref data. They have it 0.9 to 0.8 on XG. And, and like, I, I think that's, you know, that's not necessarily where we want to be from a, an attacking standpoint, but I think it is a bit reflective of how we've evolved as a team versus last season. So let, let's do that kind of analysis first. When you look at where we were last season in this fixture and where we are this season in the fixture, what's your sort of perception of how, how, how the distance we've traveled and maybe the difference in how we're approaching the game? Because what I see is a really clear, you know, a really clear change in, in how we're approaching games. And it was very evident in, in this game for me. I, I think maybe, Elia, I think at this time of year, these games mean something else. So it's almost like both teams are looking for four points from six, if you see what I mean, from each other. And so Liverpool were looking to maybe take three points from us in this game. And we're thinking we can have a point so, you know, in the back of our minds, we're thinking a point is okay, but we're going to beat them at home. They're thinking, let's beat them at home and get a point at the Emirates. Do you know what I mean? And so the game has a natural sort of feeling to it. I think, you know, it's very important for Arsenal to show their personality in this game. And by the way we started, you can almost see the game plan, wasn't you? Let's go out there and run across the ring and punch him in the face. <laughs> right? You know, literally that's what it felt like. And let's see how they react to that. And we punched him in the face three times in the first three minutes, right? And and, and scored on the third punch. And um and I was sitting there on the edge of my chair going, Oh my god, I hoped we would do this, but we're actually doing it. In some ways, did we score a little bit too early? Could we have hammered them a bit longer? Because mm. once mm. you score, you can't help but settle. Not massively, but it's, you've you've achieved what you wanted to achieve. You got the first goal. You're only in the story of the game. It's almost like five minutes too early, maybe. I know it sounds crazy, but mm. but then we 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 played and we, and we played on, and I think it's very important for us to go there and show them that we're not scared because we ended the game in February, I think it was February, March, we ended it like afraid. You're like a young team that got, yeah. you thought it was going to be us, but nah, we're still Liverpool. And by the way, you're still Arsenal. We can make you crumble. and You've got away with it because your goalkeepers made two or three world-class saves. So they walk away with a level of comfort. And since then, they've been the best team in the country on points gained. They have. They adjusted for us, for their box midfield, just for us. Cheers, lads. If you would have stepped up to us before with your normal system, we would have beat you. They adjusted for us, the best version of Liverpool, always for us. And then, in this game, they didn't, I thought it was a bit more of an even contest. Liverpool are more mature now. But I think that word maturity is a key word, Elliot. Maturity. We have grown up a little mm. bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, 0.9 to 0.8 XG, just by comparison, we had 1.4 XG in this fixture last season. It's not a ton more. They had 3.9. Mm. Wow. I mean, we got properly battered. Yeah, um, that's really You cool. know, and, and just could not get the ball away from our goal and could not get, get grips on the game. And I think 
before I even want to get to how they got their goal or you know how we got ours or how we managed through the game, I think there's two two players in particular that sort of exemplify why we were able to be more in control of this game, and that's Declan Rice and William Saliba. Obviously, yeah. we didn't have William Saliba in this fixture last season, and we didn't have Declan Rice uh, at the at the club. And I think the two of them really transformed how we were able to cope with what I think is the most intense environment you play in in football these days, right? City, yeah. whether you think City are a little better than Liverpool or not better, or they give you a different challenge. The intensity with which Liverpool sort of tear into you and want to take the game away from you is unique. And Declan Rice and William Saliba just do not react to that kind of pressure in the way normal players do. There's that one moment, I think actually Tim had it as his moment of the match um, in our instant reaction where Saliba gets it sort of near the left touch line and sprints away and Cruyffs it and gives it back and then gets it back and strides out. And he just, um, you know, he and Saliba are players for this kind of game because their heart rate, my heart rate, like was setting off, you know, my my Apple watch from the other room to call for emergency <laughs> services. Um, their heart rate doesn't seem to change in in these kinds of situations. And so, I think they're a good entry into the game in terms of the difference that we've traveled. I, I think those two allowed us to cope with this so that we could play more of our kind of football. Yeah, it's interesting that Mikel, he's been, he must have listened to a podcast earlier. He used the word washing machine, <laughs> didn't he? Right? In the actual yeah. washing yeah. machine. Stealing five ish, five is now. <laughs> mate, uh, I'll tell you, mate, Mikel, watch yourself, son. All right. So, uh, so basically. <laughs> Stay in your lane, Mikel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, but it's true, isn't it? The washing machine. And that XG from last year told us we were in it, weren't we? We were in it. It's interesting because. You know, I'm a bit more of a pragmatic person. I look at football. So if there's a chance to take another defender in, mate, I'm all for it. Do you know what I mean? So uh, and it's just the nature. I, I believe in a strong base. And, and I, th- I do think as a club, having a strong defensive identity is something maybe I've grown up with, you know, in, in our most successful times. Our most successful, successful times have come for me with our best defences. And mm. so when I look at football, I look there first. That's just the way I do. And, and if you have a base, you can play. You know, so, and with Rice coming in now, and with the Saliba being one year older, and Gabriel just, I mean, <clears throat> let's have a little chat with ourselves, should we? How we try to work out why Gabriel didn't start the season. I mean, how ridiculous does that look right now? Do you very, mean, yeah. Seriously, very ridiculous. So that story is still to be told. You put the three of them together, and our defensive mindset of everybody else, uh, we look quite good from a from a base perspective. And I'm happy with that identity because you spoke about the, the stadiums that we need to go to to win the biggest of all trophies. Well, to, we can't go there, mate, with holes with holes in our trousers. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, you need to have mm. everything solid. And we have got, as long as those guys are healthy, and my biggest worry is what happens if one of the, one of the three or four of them go down uh, and how we cover that because we're not, we're not set up for that at the moment. We're not. No. I so well, you mentioned Gabriel. He he gets the goal from a corner kick. I think Gabriel is underappreciated for a very simple mm-hmm. reason. And you see this at clubs all the time. When you've got a guy in a position who's good, but the guy who also plays a position is potentially best in the world caliber, the other guy gets underappreciated. That's yeah. just normal. That's just how it works, right? Um, you're going to live in the shadow a little bit. And Gabriel's probably living slightly in the shadow of William Saliba, who is a colossus. But I, I think it is the partnership that works so well. Um, and he gets the goal. And, you know, he. it's funny because if Saliba looks almost too calm and Rice can be so calm, and Gabriel, I think, thrives on elevated emotion. And he brings a little of that fire to Saliba's ice. Um, yeah. Great, great header from the set piece. And I thought he was imperious. He didn't lose a ground duel in this game. Uh, Saliba didn't lose an aerial duel. So there's your partnership. You know? They're fantastic. And I know that Gabriel was one of the early signings, and I think he's one of the early contract renewals. I know you can't do this, right? But sometimes I'd, I'd almost like to see him get another contract to show his value. Because I mean, us not saying we like him is one thing. But if your pay packet sits, sits tells you exactly what the cup thinks of you, that means mm. a bit more, right? And uh, I know I know football doesn't work like that, but yeah, man, I, I think he's, for the moment he's come to a club, I thought he's our best defender immediately. Uh, there were some communications issues with him in the, in the 
regarding the language, etc. And, and he was fed in slowly. Him and Saliba just make it all work, didn't they? They make they they make us dream, don't they? Because we know mm-hmm. they can go anywhere, anywhere in the world, and give whoever they're playing against a good go. Yeah, it's it's a brilliant partnership, and you know I was someone who wanted us to always think about the attack and get better attacking players, but I think I've sort of come around to understanding that you need the foundation for any house, right? And the foundation mm. is is how you defend is the spine of your team or that center back partnership. And Mikel, you know, he he went after that first and he took a big risk because the team didn't look like it was getting better as fast as people maybe wanted. But yeah. once that foundation was in place, look at how quickly the improvement came. Um, and look at the difference when that foundation isn't in place because all you have to do is go back to last season when you take out one of those load-bearing walls in Saliba and the whole thing crumbles down around it. Even Big though time. we still had all those great players up front, that it doesn't it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, it was th- a, a good start for us, I think. Your, to your point, maybe you almost scored too early. It's it's interesting because there were a couple of big moments before they got back in the game. One of them, Jesus had a really good chance from a counterattack and shot over. Sort of an unfortunate moment there. And I think not not to the extent of like the Villa game or the Brighton game, but there were more of those missed opportunities, I think, for us in transitions. This was a game that was played a little bit in transition, which is, to, to Liverpool's credit, that's the kind of game they want to provoke. And they were able to provoke that in periods, I thought, to create transitions. But we counterpressed them really well. And one of the things that was frustrating me a little bit, Clive, is there were a number of times they just passed it right to us. Yeah. And I don't know if Mikel had said to our guys, make the safe pass in this game. Don't, because he said something in his in his post-match interview that I, I thought was really um, interesting. And I, I don't have the quote in front of me right now. So I think, like, I think... Um, I'm not going to quote it exactly, but he was essentially saying, you know, we we gave them the ball a little bit in the places you can't do that, especially against them. You know, yeah. giving the ball away in certain moments. And you could kind of see it because we'd win the ball back high up the pitch and we'd recycle. And I was frustrated by that because I wanted mm-hmm. us to go, go, go. But I get, you know, Mikel referenced their counter pressing. There is that danger. They give you the ball. You go try to hurt them and attack and flood forward. That's what they want then they want to have the numerical advantage going the other way. And we saw that occasionally with some Zinchenko giveaways. So do you think that we were maybe a little more focused on security? Because I do feel that in some of the moments where we won the ball back, we emphasized recycling it, keeping it, not flooding forward and supporting those counterattacks. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I haven't seen Scott's field tilt yet, but there's a period after halftime. Very back and forth. yeah, was oh, it? yeah. Okay. yeah, that was our worst. Mm-hmm. Was that our worst? Because that's how it felt. Yep. And and maybe that coloured right my post. Time, yeah. yeah, it coloured some my post game analysis because I was I was close to throwing up at that point because I I thought myself, come on, we are. It's very it's very important what you do once you gain possession. You heard me say earlier, and they are they do what we try to do. It's a five second rule, right? Give it five seconds, mm-hmm. drop away. So those first five seconds, you you got to be crisp. You got to be really on it. You got to be really crisp, and we dallied on a few occasions, and it and it sort of disappointed me at the time. But I have to say, they're, they're not a bad side, you know. And so they're gonna they're gonna you know in a, a match full of jewels, they're gonna win some, you know what I mean? And um, and we have to accept that it, on, during at that moment in time, I was not prepared to accept it. But you know, afterwards, I'm thinking, you know what? They're not bad. He's not bad in the tackle. You know, Curtis Jones can carry the ball nicely, and Trent is their quarterback. You got, you can accept it. They have a plan. We have a plan. So I, I do think, um, looking at that, there were. I kept thinking. I don't want to say this out loud, but I'm going to say it right because I'm thinking it. There's three games this year that I've been sort of concerned with or disappointed with. That I think the conditions have had a big part in Chelsea away. I thought on that rain-sodden pitch, we couldn't move the ball very well. So we shuffled ourselves around and smashed them in seven minutes. Um, Newcastle away again, a, a, a windstorm that affected the game, made it a game of two halves. You know, even even Villa was very similar. And again, on this pitch at Anfield, mate, I don't know what they did to that pitch at Anfield, but I think it really affected the game. It suited a team that wanted to go direct. And I did spend a bit of time pre-game analysing Liverpool, and I did mention that we they are quite a direct team. Statistically, the most direct team in the league. But actually, to see it against us and feel it, Elliot, I, I was surprised how direct they actually are. They really mm. are direct. And 
numbers say one thing, but when you see it, it tells you another thing. And they don't need the pitch. They don't need it. They just basically go. And when they did try yeah. to build up, we took it off them. You know, so I've learned so about Liverpool, learn about their build up deficiencies, learn about the territory side of their game. And I've definitely learned, mate, you need to get hold of that bloke, Trent Alexander Arnold, because you get hold of him, you stop a lot of what they do. And that, that could be yeah. actually worth man marking. No, seriously, it could yeah. be worth man marking him. I think if you take him away, suddenly their ball progression is very difficult. The thing that I think is underappreciated about Liverpool is the extent to which that when they when they don't get you with the counter press, they mainly go direct. Mm. And you know, they they do it with Trent, and he's so accurate with it, it doesn't feel like your typical dice ball, you know, I'm just gonna no. like uh, lump it to the big man up front because he he has so many ways to approach you. But for their goal, which we can come to in a moment, that ball is brilliant. You you cannot let that guy stand in that amount of space and look up and decide where he wants to pass it with your line forty yards from your goal. You just you just can't do that. Um, a couple big moments before that, though. By the way, so uh, Jesus had a, had a, had a good chance. I mentioned um, Odegaard had a really nice shot dragged wide, and I have to admit, now you go with your right foot, Martin. Now you decide to use your right foot. He's always been told, goes, isn't he? He's always been told. <laughs> yeah, it, it wide. <laughs> An interesting thing to note in this game, by the way. Other than the Trent Alexander-Arnold chance, by far the biggest chance in the game, a 0.41 XG, accounting for almost half of everything they created in this game. The four biggest chances in this game were Arsenal chances um, in terms of you know expected goals. So mm. you know we created the better of the chances. Half of their creation came off that one goal. Um, you know, just to give you an idea of the Mohamed Salah goal, you know, FB Ref, if you care about this stuff, only has that at 0.08. You know, I think sometimes you have to remember this This guy's just really, really brilliant at what he does. We ended the game, by the way, with the last four shots of the game. Um, you know, in the last 10 minutes plus stoppage time, Arsenal had four shots to Liverpool's none. It's just a little bit interesting back and forth there. Before we get to their goal, Clive, I think we have to talk about the handball. Mm -hmm. This is the problem with football. Football has laws that need to be interpreted, and some of the interpretations right now are just all over the map. There is a rule, uh, a clarification on the law of the game around handball. And it says it cannot be handball if it strikes an arm for balance while falling between the body and the ground that's supporting you while falling. It does not say whether that arm should be on the ground as I've always seen it interpreted. Yeah. It's got to be on the ground. So you're sliding or you're falling and your arm is on the ground and the ball strikes an arm that is on the ground. That cannot be handball. Odegaard's arm was not on the ground, but he was falling, and it was the arm that was sort of giving him balance, so to speak, that was pointed down towards the ground. Most of the broad opinion on this outside of the Arsenal world is that it is handball. Mm -hmm. I got to admit, I thought in the moment it would be called handball, and had it happened to us, I'd probably want it. But this is kind of how I want games to be refereed, if I'm honest, which is that shouldn't be a goal for Liverpool which is what it yes. would become if you give a handball. So Good the point. equitable outcome was given, just as I think the equitable outcome was probably given with the Kai Havertz shout, because I've seen those given too. It is a bit of a barge in the back. All in all, I can't complain about a referee in a game where the referee isn't the story. And that's all yeah. we really want from a game. Don't be the story. And while I think Liverpool fans today will be quite mad because they feel that they should have had a handball, and I understand that, and they feel that Bukayo Saka should have been sent off, this isn't a game yeah. where getting a penalty or Bukayo Saka being sent off would have reflected the equitable outcome of how the game was played. So I like how this was refereed, but I'm curious your thoughts with a day to sleep on it now about that handball call or non-call. Yeah, uh, look, I'm not an expert on handball and I'm not sure who is, but thanks for reading that rule out because I didn't know that precisely. Uh, mm. My feeling on the day was I can find a reason why they didn't give it, right? But I could also find a reason why they could give it. And I don't think no one can say 100% they, they're correct either way. Um, I said to you on the, on the IR, I've never seen a handball given when your hand is below the knee. you know, and, and I just haven't, because if you're falling down to putting your hand down, I just haven't. The TV told me that if your hand's coming back towards your body, do you make yourself smaller? That's another rule. I didn't know that until they said it. I mean, there's rules everywhere mm -hmm. that I didn't know, or interpretations, or, or interpretations that drive your outcome. I didn't know that, you know. So um, when I look at it at some angles, I'm thinking, mate, you you, you did everything but dribble it. 
you know, he literally mm-hmm. dribbled it and, and took a three-point shot. I mean, if you're a Liverpool fan, that's all you can see. Do you see what I mean? And so, mm-hmm. to say, we got away with it. But I think it's the right thing. My issue with, you know, it's a very good point you made there. That doesn't deserve a goal. And that's what it would have been. And, and, and I don't think that's right. And, I, and that is a great way to look at penalties for me. You know, does are you stopping something significant that's going to lead towards a goal? Or is that something incidental that someone slips on a pitch is going to go down and it hits his arm? And you want that to be the difference between you winning and losing a game? That's where football's got to look at itself and decide what constitutes a penalty kick. You know, that's what we're talking about here, which is basically eight times out of ten a goal. You know, so guesswork there. Scott's saying 8.3.2 right now, but (laughs) but guesswork there. And so, yeah, that's not right. And so I'm glad it had the outcome for the game. And if 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 it had been us, and by the way, I don't think Havertz was a penalty, neither. But I hear what you're saying about seeing them given. I don't think it was a penalty in in this game. But I also don't think the handball that Havertz had in the other day should have stopped him scoring, you know, take that goal away against Villa. So, mate, just got to take it, go with it, right? We lost one against Villa and maybe we got one here. Yeah. And I mean, this is the problem with the laws of the game and why it always makes it a little bit difficult because, again, the exact language is a player is falling and the ball hits their supporting arm, which is between their body and the ground. Mm. Well, does their supporting arm mean it is actually supporting them and is on the ground? Or does it mean it's their supporting arm in terms of it's the arm that would naturally go down to support them while they're falling? And if it is on the ground, are they still falling? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, this is why there's 138 page rulings on whether Mikel Arteta, you know, brought the game into disrepute or whatever. (laughs) It's just like the, the laws of the game require interpretation and the interpretations are broad. And, and I, you know, I wish that one was clearer, but I do think that the equitable outcome was achieved by the referee in most situations in this game. So we'll come to their goal then. There's going to be a big conversation about Alexander Zinchenko. And we can start it with their goal. But I will say this. I feel that Alexander Zinchenko did things in this game that are pretty inexcusable. But I think the goal is about the least among them. As I've mm. already said... I feel we gave Trent too much room. I think Zinchenko's biggest error in that situation is not holding the line. He needed to be brave. He drops a little too much so that Sal is onside. And then once he's in that 1v1, I'd like Gabriel to get over to him a little sooner, to give mm-hmm. him the support a little sooner. But be that as it may, as I've said, it's a 0.08 XG chance. Salah keeps it from going out of play, cuts it inside. Zinchenko shouldn't show him to his left. Fine. You know, I accept that. But... That's a brilliant player making a brilliant play and he finishes brilliantly. The funny thing is he could have had a goal before that when Zinchenko does something worse, I think, which is he comes to try to help Gabriel win a header. The ball yeah. goes over both of them and and Salah's at the back post and hits it into the side netting. Um, so I, I think what I would say is the Zinchenko conversation is one we should have, but it's it's the giveaways over elaborating in his play that worry me much more than getting beat once by Salah. And we should point out that Salah statistically had one of his worst games of the season in some ways from underlying metrics, certainly one of his less good games up against Sinchenko. And so I I guess what I'm saying is defensively, we, we had a pretty good performance. Um, this was a very well-executed goal. I, I don't think that this is a huge error particularly. Yeah, it's an interesting one. We had a good chat, didn't we, last night on the IR. We almost came to Sinchenko IR. And... Um, mm. And he's one of those players that he, he does. He's, I say, I don't want to say the word divisive, but I think there's two faces to him. There's one face when he's in the last line, and there's one face when he's in the lineup. And fair enough, my critique in, of him is in the one when he's in the lineup. Because when he's in our last line, I know who he is. I'm not learning nothing about what he does in the last line. Some days he's fantastic, some days he jumps out of his boots, some days he can be nutmegged. I, I know this. Do you know what I mean? So, but in when he's in the interior, I have a different expectation on him because I know I've got a bit of a trade off in the back line. But when you're in the interior and we've got Martinelli and we've got Havertz ahead of you, and um, we have no granite shackle this year, so a lot of ball progression is on you, Zinchenko, on that side. You know, so because cause Kai isn't a ball progressor, he's someone you've got to pass to. 
You know what I mean? And you've got to you know, to bounce off and to run through on. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the ball progression is on you. And I need you to be better. The left-hand side needs to wake up. And you have to wake that side up. And so I'm a lot harder on him in that line. And it was in that line I have a concern about it. But then, and Tim quite rightly said, and you probably already know this, the who makes our most passes into the final, into the last third? Well, it's him. But well, what we trade off for, given we've got Declan Wells dropping into our back line and Gabriel out or left back on occasions, I almost expect him to be the main ball progressor with Odegaard into the final third because the other four are already there. Do you see what I mean? And so it comes back to, are we getting enough ball progression? Are we getting enough ball security? That's, the, that's it for me. But that's not in every game because there are mm. games and there's Man City, Man United, Spurs, <laughs> Liverpool, they're the, they're the hot ones. And in those games, everything is clear. Everything is clear and a little bit edgier in our analysis because it means more if it goes the other way. You know, and when you see Zinchenko and Odegaard not communicating and Zinchenko slide tackling our skipper, leaving a, a four on one <laughs> or five on two, wherever it was, um, you can't, you are quite within your rights to question what you're watching on occasions while recognizing mm. his value. It's just one game. This is called the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. So we are discussing this match. You want to discuss trends? Let's discuss trends. Sometimes on occasions he steps on the ball. And he does. But sometimes he plays a pass around the corner that none of us can see on our cities. And we have to decide the value proposition. We have to decide, is there a, another player or is there another way to do this? And I think if I'm looking at a team, I'd be looking there and saying, you know what, let me have a look at this another way to, to put some competition into that area. We just changed our goalkeeper, for God's sake. Are you telling me we can't do that there as well? You know, so mm. it, it can happen, right? And if we want to get to be the best team in the world, we have to look at these things. We have to. I, I think an interesting thing to do is to go to whoscored.com, <clears throat> go to this game, and mm. go to the chalkboard, select touches, <clears throat> And look at the Zinchenko touches and then look at the White touches. Ben White played right back in this game in a fairly traditional sense. He yeah. stayed wide. He stayed compact. He, he kept he kept the width, but he also kept the defensive line. Yeah. Then three, you look three, at Zinchenko's two. touches and I'd say a third of them at least are in the middle of the park or even in the right half space. Um, he's all over the place. Now, you could say he shouldn't be, but clearly he's been given that role. He's not, I don't think yeah. he's freelancing. Mikel wouldn't allow that. Um, here, here's the difficulty I have with this discussion. You could say we should play someone other than Zinchenko because he's becoming too much of a liability defensively. What I could say is if you don't have Zinchenko, maybe he doesn't give the ball away a couple of times. Maybe that Salah goal doesn't happen. Maybe he doesn't fall down on a corner kick and lead to a five on two. But but maybe because you don't have Zinchenko, Liverpool finds it much easier to keep us penned in our defensive third. Yeah. We find it much harder to find a way out. We start going long. We start hoofing it. The ball starts coming right back to us. And because of that, we're under much more pressure. And we wind up with that 3.9 XG game yeah. that Liverpool had last season instead of the .9 one this season where almost half of that came from one chance. The whole conversation is a risk-reward conversation. And I will fully acknowledge that he is probably creating too much risk at this moment. But I think what we are doing out of the panic of that risk, Clive, is throwing the baby out with the bathwater, throwing out the reward, ignoring that he is always a leader or right there for us in progressive passes, final third entries, right? Touches, passes completed. And what he does that I think is so important Alexander Zinchenko goes to where he can create a numerical advantage for us. He becomes the fourth man or the third man in a triangle so that he can, so we can play around pressure and around congestion. He goes and becomes that extra man and creates mm. a numerical superiority in whatever area of the pitch we need it. And that is a critical part of how we play and how we control the game. And yep. I don't think you're going to see many teams go to Liverpool, go to Anfield and have the kind of control we had and suppress their chance creation. I think there's a few shots they've had all season. So I want to try to be thoughtful about 
understanding what we'd lose without Zinchenko while acknowledging what he is doing that I don't like. And I really think you nailed it, Clive. I mean, to me, the biggest issue I had with Zinchenko in this game are these sloppy, lazy giveaways in areas he shouldn't. And and Mikel referenced that. He said there was a giveaway in one area where we suddenly had Declan Rice has to save us, which is essentially what did happen uh, yeah. in one one time when Zinchenko gave it away. And so that the question is, can he do that? Can yeah. he be cleaner in the way he plays while still giving us the benefits? Or is it a case of where we have to move on to someone who will give it away less, but maybe give us less of that control in possession and progressiveness? I mean, it, it is a difficult question to answer at the moment. It is. And, you know, I think I didn't know the level of control that Zinchenko has given us existed before he arrives. I'll be straight yeah. with you. I, th- I think him and Jay-Z has transformed all transformed my view of the game of this Arsenal team. Mm-hmm. When they landed, I thought, oh my goodness, what are we what is this all about? And we all had the season we had last year. And Zinchenko was right there. In fact, every time he got injured, we were devastated. Right? Because we knew we couldn't play the same way without him. And when Mikel was talking about, I'm so pleased with our personality, paraphrasing here, coming here and playing like this and keeping going, you know what? I bet you Zinchenko's the number one player in his mind and he's saying those words. Because a player that had a rocky 10 minutes, uh, which I stopped falling for, <laughs> and the player that ended the game once we refound our feet again, were two different people, right? You are allowed to have bad form or bad moments without being a bad player. Do you know what I mean? And I think differentiating between the difference is really, really key. I, I, I didn't know a box midfield could play like this until he came. So he has really lifted it. But the fact he's lifted my expectations is that I expect him to be more secure than Gabriel and Saliba because that's what you're there for. And I see the possession lost. They're very, very similar. I need you to be the guy that doesn't quite lose it as much as them. Mate, I know you're going to get run past. It's not a problem. <laughs> we got you. Mm. But look after the ball for me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Look after the ball for me because it's really important. I know, you, I know you're the smallest guy in our back line. Don't worry about that. We got you. But look after the ball. Look after the ball. Yeah. You know? And that's that's it. Yeah. That's what and that's why that's why what I want to see. And and the reality is too, like the heat and intensity and nerves and passion of watching that game, Clive, means that you are going to over index the big plays. You just yeah. are. Yeah. The times when we're playing out from the back to control possession so that we have a five minute spell where we're under no threat, you're not going to remember those. But no. the time he gave it away and stuck Rice in a really bad situation where he had to bail us out, you're going to remember that because your heart is in your throat. The yeah. time where he tripped and took Odegaard out and they had a five on two, you're going to remember that because that's in yeah. your throat. The time where Mohamed Salah made him look bad, of course you're going to remember that. And those are the, the, the hardest thing about analyzing football. You have the people who will say football is actually about the moments where nothing happens and they're under undervalued. And you have some people who would say football is actually just about the moments where goals are scored. And if mm. football is just about the moments where goals are scored, right now Zinchenko is a live question because the goals we're giving away are related to him. An interesting thing Scott does, Scott has a, a way of calculating positive plays, plays that increase scoring probability by 1% or okay. greater, and negative plays, plays that increase the opposition's chance of scoring by 1% or greater. Now, I realize this is sort of squishy um, data stuff, but just bear with me for a second because this is interesting. Saka was second yesterday with a plus five, right? Meaning he had five more chances that helped us score, could have helped us score, against ones that could have helped Liverpool score. So he had 16 positive plays, but he had 11 negative. Zinchenko led us with a plus eight, 11 positive, and just three that register as negative according to the way Scott rates this. The problem is those three were three really big ones, and we can probably all picture them very clearly in our head. Yeah, And that's the hard part. Do the 11 positive ones he did make up for the three that could have lost us a game? I don't want to do this too much longer, but I guess what I would say is I can totally understand anyone who thinks that Zinchenko is a weakness and teams are figuring that out, and it and we have to think about that carefully. But I think you have to be a bit 
willing to acknowledge that there are so many things he does for how we play that have caused us to be a dominant on the ball team, a team that progresses well. I, for so many years, Clive, all you had to do was press us a little bit in midfield and we collapsed. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore and he's a part of that. So I, I would be prepared to replace him with an option that's more secure, but you have to at least be willing to acknowledge that there's some things that come with his risks that we would that we would miss. And yeah, I think absolutely. that's just the debate, you know? My, 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 there are games and there are Liverpool who attack where, <laughs> Elliot? Their two best yeah. players, where are they positioned? On the right, right, on the right edges, hand yeah. side. Of yeah, certain on the team. right, yeah. And so that's all. Trent, Trent that's and Salah. All it, that's all it is. And where are they going to go? They're going to go into that position. So for, for this day, we might do something else. It doesn't mean that Zinchenko should be fired out of a gun, so you say, how you say? fired out of a gun <laughs> into the sun. It just means for this day, knowing where their superpower is, mate, I would have done something else on the day. But but maybe we'd have got a full XG against, you know, so I'm with you. It's just, yeah. it's just football, right? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Yeah, well, the, the, the reality is too, I mean, this is where I'm going to do the whole appeal to authority. I'm just going to trust Mikel. I know Mikel doesn't like chaos. I know Mikel doesn't like sloppiness. I know Mikel thinks back to front with his football. If mm. Mikel is still willing to not only start Zinchenko, but finish with Zinchenko in a game of this magnitude, there's something there that he believes in. I think it is a good sign, by the way, Clive, and Tim called this out well in the instant reaction. Zinchenko didn't get subbed off in this game, and I thought he finished strong. Now, to be fair, Liverpool helped us by moving Salah centrally, and he got no joy out of Saliba and Gabriel and Declan Rice. But the fact that Odegaard, uh, that Odegaard, that uh, Zinchenko finished the game, I think is a good sign and finished the game strong. So we'll just have to see. Look, if you want to be frustrated about Zinchenko giveaways, you can. But there's another thing you could be frustrated about. And that is, once again, I think this is a game where the result is down to Liverpool having a moment of sheer genius from their genius wide player and us not getting a moment of sheer genius from our wide players. Um the, the Martinelli thing is interesting because he was our leading goal scorer last season. Uh, he's such a brilliant player. And what's what's painful about Martinelli is so much of the opportunity he wastes is opportunity he created. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like his speed, his pace, his dynamism, his like there's there's one thing I I, I actually jotted it down about 21st minute. Martinelli gets it on the touchline in our defensive third nutmegs a guy, gets past him, bursts up the touchline, rides a challenge, gives it to Sack in transition. Now it comes to nothing. But then, you know, he misses an open goal. He gives it away loosely on the touchline. I thought he faded too. I mean, I, he he is someone who sp spends so much energy in his game that I don't know that he always looks able to go the 90 minutes. But what do you think about this Martinelli situation? I, in, he was definitely wasteful in this game. That is a theme that is becoming too common. Um, and yet, in terms of keeping the width, the the pace to push opposition back lines back, we don't we don't really have another Martinelli in the team. So I I don't know where to go with this. Just patience, maybe. <clears throat> yeah, I suppose when you're that gifted as he is, particularly physically gifted, where you're literally probably one of the faster two players on the pitch every time you walk onto it, with pacey players, wide players. We just expect them to run fast all the time <laughs> and just do everything yep. correctly. We're incredibly harsh on white people. Once we know they can beat somebody, we just expect it. Why are you beating him? Oh my God, he's been pocketed. He's been tackled like once out of eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, um, and so but the issue is, for me, is just not having the ability to have three really good white players so that if they want, everyone has a dip, we don't change our face and bring on somebody else a bit more of a white creator. You know, um, but Man City won trouble last year with two wide sprinters and two wide creators, right? So it's it's whatever you decide what you like in those areas, but there's a burden upon him. But I will say he is starting to think maybe a little about his decisions just a little mm. bit too long. And that is a signal that maybe you're mm. starting to realize you're not in top form. And so you want to make sure when you feel confident, and we've seen the rise in confidence with Havertz. He's making quicker decisions now. He's not dilly dallying and going backwards. He's just making quick decisions and disappearing into areas that are going to hurt people. When you feel good, you just do things instinctively. And the instinct has gone a little bit. And it, it can come back. And that's and this is what happens. You know, it can come back. 
both our wide players feel a little bit like we're not sure it's going to quite happen with that last thing. Right? So, and because we have a centre forward who is normally everywhere but a centre forward, this mean, it's this, this over indexes things in our mind, isn't it? To take your word. And so we mm. are looking for them to deliver. And when maybe that chance, it sort of flashed up on the TV a bit strange. I think the TV sort of missed it live. And Saka was mm. like running through already when, they, when the camera flashed to him. So I don't know how it got there. I don't know if he was offside. But then he comes inside and he doesn't take the early shot. He's trying to create something very, very definite. You know, again, that goalkeeper sitting there, he looks like a he looks like a mountain, doesn't he? He makes you think about your last thing that you do. It comes across to Martin, then he then then he does has a little slip. And to be honest, if I'm honest with you, I thought that reverse shot was really good. There wasn't mm. a lot of goal to to aim for, and it was just unfortunate went past the post. Now in this game, we're not going to forget it, are we? We just don't forget no. it. When games matter, we don't forget it. We, you know, we we haven't forgotten party losing the ball to Rice at West Ham. You know, we, uh, uh, we, things stay in your mind, don't they, when it really matters. Ramsdale's pass out against Southampton. What are you doing? He's made loads of mistakes, but remember that one. Because certain things yeah. stay in your mind when it matters. And um, and so, yeah, I he looked a bit bereft in this game. But so what? We brought Trossard on. I thought he did fine. And I think mm. how we use him and playing through this is really important. We played Havertz through to so play him through. He'll come out the other side, and he'll be fine. Yeah, I thought the entire front three was a little wasteful with mm. reasonable opportunities. It was a quiet-ish game for Jesus. Um, Saka was very, very involved. And it's interesting because I think we had a, a difference of viewpoint in the instant reaction about Saka. But you know, I was looking at some Saka numbers coming out of the game, and one that jumps out to me is progressive passes received, okay? Yeah, yeah. In progressive passes received, Saka led everyone in the whole game. He had 16. The next closest was Salah with 12, okay? Yeah. No one on Liverpool other than that had more than, fi- had more than five. We had a couple with seven. Kai Havertz, who I thought had a good game, and Gabriel Martinelli. But Bukayo Saka far and away the leader with 16. And I think this... this hits on something that you may be captured that I don't think I caught on to necessarily in the instant reaction. Surprise, surprise. Um, it's I think Saka was also wasteful and had one of his less good games in execution. But in a game of this intensity and pressure, you have to have that guy you can give the ball to for comfort and control. And, you know, those progressive passes received, right? 16 of them. Those aren't just potentially dangerous moments where Saka is isolated on... Um, you know, Simicast or Joe Gomez or whoever it is. And he rarely gets isolated because they double him. Those are times you got the ball to safe feet, right? To to someone who controls it so everyone can join the attack, so you can generate movement up the pitch and get away from your goal. So while I think that Martinelli was wasteful and I think that Saka was also wasteful, I think the difference in Saka is we give him the ball for comfort and to get up the pitch and to establish territory. And he did do that for us in this game if he didn't necessarily, if we didn't execute from those moments the way I'd like. Yeah, so <clears throat> I purposely don't really look at stats too much before I do an IR because it will color my view, right? Because I mm-hmm. do think yeah. there's a there's a feeling, there's an emotion in football. And when you are scared out of your life and you you're and you're desperate to win, your emotions go to certain people. Who's going to do it for me? Who's going to do it for me? If your analysis is outcome based, then my sort of sack of pick could be picked apart. You know, literally picked mm. apart. As my Zinchenko pick could have been picked apart if he's outcome based. But an emotion, I'll, I'll fight you on that one. I'll fight you on Zinchenko, how he made me feel. And I'll fight you on uh, Saka, how he makes you feel. Because I think he was our most dangerous forward. For the for the entire period of the game, and I felt we were playing to him a lot. We and I, I didn't think he was beat his man every single time. But how many crosses he put in that we didn't move for? You know, it's like I just felt he was getting at them, getting at them. And I guarantee you, the Liverpool team talk would have been about him at the end of the game. What a good player he is, you know, because he made them shift. It's funny that Edu did a post about Saka really praising his performance. This is a billion pound project, right? And this is a major, major game in that project. Not to do well here. And Saka performed in this game. Uh, he, and I'm, I'm huge on that. 
I, I, my worry is, fair enough, Elliot, Gary Neville does a podcast, if you ever catch it, it's just a little YouTube podcast he does after the game. Mm. And um, Gary Neville podcast, and did with Jamie Carragher this time. I'm going to say something's going to be controversial, but I thought his analysis of the Arsenal game and Carragher was, was absolutely spot on. I thought it was it was mm. almost word perfect. They were very, they, they Carragher both said Arsenal are slightly better than Liverpool at the moment which I thought was very magnanimous, given the game was very, very even. They could both see that Arsenal's mm. structure looked a bit, little bit better. But going there was said something about the front three. He said, I worry about the front three at Arsenal. They're really talented. And he called Jesus Rooney, which I thought was a fantastic analogy. He's all action forward, mm. bustling, makes things happen. That's a really good analogy, that was. But he said that it's something I've not thought about before. He said our front three as a three don't always connect as a three. I thought that is really interesting because we have all spoken about the isolation factor, you know, with, with them. And I thought that is interesting. Now, I hadn't thought of it that way around. And in this game, maybe it was quite prevalent because of the crosses, no one went in the back post, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe it's a bit of recency, but maybe that's something for us to think about. How as a three, we can connect better. Is that distances? Is that a system change? Or is that a bit more cohesion as a three not as individuals as a three i think that's something maybe to think about when we think about how we're going to evolve this team going forward yeah that is an interesting one i <clears throat> i also would like to see this game replayed with the right studs on i mean oh, the pitch was terrible God. and we were sliding all over the place and if you look at some of the key moments of the game their five on two comes from zinchenko slipping and taking out odegaard yeah the Bukayo Saka incident where Simicast unfortunately breaks his collarbone, you hate to see that. Yeah. That comes from Bukayo riding Skipping. a challenge on the touchline, but if you watch it again, his right foot slides on the pitch. He skates, and that's what causes the contact to be a little weird, and then he takes out Klopp, which is kind of funny, actually. Um, the one where, where Saka could have gotten his second yellow, again a slip, Yeah. and there were a couple of key slips in moments where we were had reasonable attacking positions that – killed moves yeah um it was just really unfortunate because i you know I, it's partly the pitch but to be fair it's partly arsenal's fault you got to say because the liverpool players weren't having nearly the trouble because they had the right studs on we <laughs> don't think we did but they were, fall, so they were falling too elliot they were falling too yeah. a little bit and maybe i honest, just remember but, ours because yeah because <laughs> i'm the arsenal fan. You, care, you care about ours yeah. <laughs> right? so, yeah. yeah but you know on on trent shot let's be honest that ball's popping across the pitch to him and it hops up a little bit and that's why he hits the crossbar he does at the Emirates, mate, similar to Son's chance and when Madison popped it to him. It's a goal, isn't it? It runs to him true. And um, so, yeah, their pitch cost them maybe the game. And I do think they played a fast one there. But, hey, look, I am yeah. 100% biased. <laughs> it, it would have, Look, Trent should score. And, you know, if, if the shoe's on the other foot, the only thing we're talking about on this pod are probably the handball and the Trent chance if this was the Liverpool vision podcast and like, you know, I can, I can totally understand that perspective. Do I think that would have been reflective of the game that was played? I think the game was played to a draw. I do. Yeah. Um, and, and I think Zinchenko slipping and taking out Odegaard leading to that chance would not have been a reflection of how we played. I think it would have been a reflection of one of those critical weird error moments leading to the goal that decides the game. And by the way, that's kind of how football works. I get it. But that's 0.41 of their 0.9 expected goals. Otherwise, this is 0.8 for Arsenal to 0.5 for Liverpool. And by the way, I get it. You can't just yada yada their biggest chance of the game, but it comes from a freakish slip moment. So I, I would just have hated to see that moment decide a game that I think was played at a really high level, evenly to roughly a draw on the balance of it. Um, yeah. On the Saka thing, I get frustrated with myself sometimes because I go down the social media rabbit hole and you have to remind yourself social media has two things. One, every dumb opinion on the planet is on <laughs> social media. And two, the algorithms are fine tuned to boost the dumbest opinions because they will drive the most engagement. Can you just tell me to ignore the debate over whether Saka was somehow dirty with that oh, just, Simicast challenge on the touchline. I mean, the, there is a narrative developing in, in Liverpool circles that Saka's a dirty player, tried to injure players, yada, yada, yada. Um, seriously? That seems silly to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, 
he's not exactly so, Ron. Don't Har- ignore it. So I don't you know. ignore it. He's not exactly Ron Chopper Harris, is he? Do you know what I mean? He's like a, <laughs> <laughs> for those of a certain age, you know what I'm yeah, talking sweet. about. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, this is a uh, this. <laughs> shall we just move on? And fair enough. Yeah, David Graves sort of said something. He sort of said, I heard he's got a hospital. I'm really sorry about that. And so they, this guy guy sort of said, oh, so you're apologizing then? Well, hold on. He's just like being a nice person, you know, just being a nice mm-hmm. person. Hey, look, as far as I'm concerned, mate, get in the gym, son. You got bodied. And um, he was trying to buy a foul. He got bodied. He ended up in an awkward situation and hurt himself, unfortunately. Um, that's just the game. It wasn't even a foul given. It's just nothing there. Interesting, by the way, you talk about uh, post-match stuff. William Saliba was awarded um, Man of the Match, which I thought was great because he deserved it. And I think up against Van Dyke in particular, I, I, you know, I love to see him getting his flowers in that moment up against the guy that has d- defined the position for so many seasons. But Clive, I don't know if you saw this. He, there was an interview he was doing, mm-hmm. and the interviewer says, "I have to ask you about the penalty incident." But he says about the handball penalty, and Saliba says, "Yeah, it's, it's a penalty, definitely," but. I'm not the referee. We have to accept it and move on. I, w- I have this conspiracy theory because everyone's, you know, circulating that. Say, see, even, even the Arsenal players think it was a penalty. I think he thinks he's being asked about our penalty shout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you might and he's be saying, right. Yeah, because if he thinks he's talking about the handball penalty, why would he say we have to accept it and move on? Yeah. It wouldn't make any sense. So I think he just assumes he's being asked about what I'm sure he thinks is a penalty, which is Kai Havertz being pushed over. Yeah. By the way, for the record, that falls so squarely into the scene them given. I wouldn't want the game, as I said earlier, decided by penalties in this case. No. But I've also seen them given. Um, Your mileage may vary on how much you want that one. I mean, look, I'd like to win this game by disqualification. I win it any way I can take it. But I think this was a fair reflection. <laughs> but but so I was just curious if you had seen that when your thoughts are. Because because my opinion is, I I think he doesn't really hear the handball part of the question, and he's he's talking about the penalty he thinks we should have been given. Otherwise, the answer doesn't make a lot of sense in context. Yeah, I, I tend to I tend to agree with you. And obviously, after the IR last night, you were quite definitive about that penalty could have been given. I thought, let me see what Elliot's talking about. So I, look, I had a little look afterwards. And you know what? Mm-hmm. If you wanted to see it, you can see it. You know, mm-hmm. particularly left leg contact from Trent, actually. You know, if you want to see it, you can see it. Now, I wouldn't expect it. I genuinely wouldn't expect it. I thought Kai was going down a little bit sooner than that. Mm. But, yeah, it's very similar to the, was it, was it the Man United one this year when he ran through and he, he got squeezed from both sides and his old big feet yeah. are hanging around loose. <laughs> and, uh, and he they got decided to it's a clear and obvious error to give it a penalty. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I thought that was more of a penalty than, than this one, actually. But, yeah, you are right. Seen him give him territory, but... Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm cool with it. I think penalty kicks need to be looked at differently, Elliot. And we've said that in the past, haven't we? And um, so let's higher not threshold go. should be a higher threshold. Yeah, he's yeah. got to be it's too you, important. You know where I think in particular that that stands out to me is um, I sort of have this opinion that you shouldn't be able to use slow motion replays to mm. to look at penalties. About so, did you watch the Spurs game where they got kind of battered but got away with it? I Everton. watched it through your Twitter timeline because we don't get all the games okay. over here. Oh, and you were so, well, fuming let me tell you. <laughs> they got away with one. They got battered, like properly mm. battered. Um, Everton had a goal disallowed. Kind of reminds me of the one we had disallowed against United when Martinelli scored brilliantly at Old Trafford. There's a foul Ooh, in the buildup. I can see that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a foul in the buildup. It probably is a foul, but here's what I'll say. In real time, when you don't watch it slow down, it just looks like the Everton man is stronger in the challenge and wins it. When you slow it down to super duper slow motion and you see a little contact between the two feet, it looks like, oh, he kicked his ankle. These super slow motion replays at times can make any contact be like, oh, there's contact. But when you watch it in full speed, what you just see is football. Players coming together, challenging for a ball, one man stronger than the other. And so I think these super slow motion replays do no one any justice because they take the context out of the the, the pace and intensity and combativeness of football and turn it into a forensic analysis of whether two body parts collided. So that's just a, a little um, wayward moment, a little sojourn yeah, over to Spurs world. One, where they got I did mm-hmm. see that incident. 
very much like Holy Guard. And you can now we get a view of the VAR sort of recording. You know, you, we can hear them. You can almost yep. hear them saying, possible foul, possible this, blah, blah, blah. Is it offside? Can we check? Mm-hmm. Can we check? The, the, the nervousness around checking every moment when a goal is scored is acute. And so they would have to go back and have a look at that. And if you're looking for something, you can find it. You can mm. if you want to. And to me, that's just the game, really, to, to double down on your point. So, yeah, agreed. And to be fair, I think there is a survivor, survivorship bias thing that goes on with refereeing decisions. As Arsenal fans, we can literally list every single time the referees have screwed us this season. But I guarantee you, no one can list the times the referees didn't screw us this season. And we should mm. file away that Odegaard handball. Just for the yeah. next time we want to go too far down the conspiracy theory road, we should file it away because today Liverpool fans are saying Saka should have been sent off and Liverpool fans are saying they should have had handball and they're saying there's a conspiracy against Liverpool to help Arsenal. So I think we should just keep all of these things in mind that it's a grayer area. I will say Dale Johnson, of course, the guy who does his VAR review after a season of telling us we haven't been screwed at all, pops up and says the handball call was a clear handball and VAR screwed it up. So seriously, <laughs> that guy, he can get in the seat. Oh I swear my to God. God. Dale, Dale, no, no offense, man, but come on, you're killing me here. Um, okay. <laughs> so we haven't talked about a couple of, a couple of players, a couple of things. Um, one is this, this is a game where I don't feel any need to talk about Raya, which is probably exactly what you want. Um, I think you and I had a slight disagreement on the instant reaction in that I went to my old bugbear. I went to my old uh, hobby horse of, I thought he went long, not oh, accurately yeah. enough too often. But to your point, which I think is right, you're hitting it long to Kai Havertz, who's got a big height advantage and playing away from the areas of the pitch where Liverpool want you playing. So I think I've come around to the idea that, you know what? You go long against Liverpool because you don't play into their counter press. That's exactly what you don't do, right? You don't play into the press. You don't play into the counter press, and you have a, an advantage in Havertz. It just so happens, as I said on the instant reaction, I think he completed two of his long balls. He was twenty five percent passing on the night, so it it didn't come off. But I guess I can see the idea. But overall, quite content with the Raya performance. Claimed well on a number of occasions, which I thought is really important. Swept up well. Um, no complaints, and no complaints is better than than I think where we've been at times this season. So good enough for me. Yeah. I, I sort of, with the goalkeeper, I always look for the emphasis where we're playing. I think a team performance has its heart, you know, and mm. not, when we went back to him, I didn't feel stressed, even though the pitch was crap. Uh, there was one left foot, one maybe that he could have gone, could have done it in two, went longer mm. directly on his left foot. I think he wasn't very good. Apart from that, I can think of nothing else. I can remember Liverpool trying to take free kicks and him being really aggressive and force them to think about where they're going to put the free kick. And he's saying, yeah, put it in here if you want and I'll come and get it. So that presence alone was really important for us. He's obviously the, on the ball, he's, he's really good. And his ball striking is really good. And I personally don't really care if, he's, if he doesn't succeed in any of them. But if we are managed to stress their t- exits and stress their clearances, and we get the second ball, I bet that doesn't show up in the stats. Do you know what I mean? And so if he goes into mm. that, and, and Kai loses a header with Konate, but Zinchenko picks it up, and we're off and running, and we and Zinchenko's got final third entry passes in, in the sky, then how's that happened? It happened by where we're playing the game. So I'd much rather play the game where we did, in this game, in a big game, by the way, play where we did on the pitch, versus other games where I've questioned the the height of our line and questioned where we're playing the game. Chelsea, for example, we played in, for me, far too deep, too long. You know, and um, as soon as we went a bit more direct, we killed them. And so you just got to feel the game. And I, and I was fine with Ray. I thought it's one of his better games. I said to yesterday, I thought it was the biggest game he's ever played in. And I genuinely do think that's the biggest game he's ever played in. It's his, and and it, and his next biggest game was City at home. Do you mm. see what I mean? These games are massive now, Elliot. They're massive. And when we go to Etihad, that's going to be his next biggest game of his life. Do you know? So um, mm. he is doing this for Arsenal for the first time. This ain't. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, mate. This ain't Brentford. This is you're doing it for Arsenal Football Club, mate. If you don't tie Lacey straight, we're having a debate about it. Do you see? Do you see what it is? And and mm-hmm. it's very important. And so, yeah, he's come through one today. And I did hear sort of Andrew talk about this earlier. I mean, I missed up I missed up on a little bit. And Tim mentioned it as well about how the TV were zeroing on him 
as a as a narrative, for example, mm-hmm. which I think was really unfair. Yeah, I think coming at a halftime, he, he was the apparently Sky coverage. Was it Sky? Was it on Sky? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was saying it's a big half for David Raya. Yeah, I must. And I must. I missed like, that. Why? <laughs> why was it a big half for David Raya? Yeah, um, I, I, I you know, I, I mean, <laughs> and, yeah. and it just goes to show you at the moment. If you look at Arsenal from thirty thousand feet, they're looking at the goalkeeper, and they're looking at our centre forward. They're saying, "Do they score enough goals?" And as our tent, I've mismanaged the, tenor, the goalkeeper thing, and that's our way to get out. You no, know, because defensively you can't. Do, do you think a big reason for the narrative too is like one of the reasons this could have been a really bad night for Raya had it gone poorly is it would have been held up against this sort of quintessential Ramsdale performance. If I mm. say name a Ramsdale performance from last season, you probably say Anfield is the first one. He was mm. the best he's ever been in terms of at least keeping the ball out of his net. Um, that night, I already mentioned the 3.9 expected goals. Like, do you think that plays into it? That it was a, it was sort of a seminal Ramsdale performance that they would have been measuring it up against. I, you know, for me, the reason I think the keeper talk is probably going to quiet down is first of all, Ramsdale might go and whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, I think most of us have come around to the idea that a, a decision has been taken. So I would yeah. say that might be part of it though. Clive, do you think it's just the, the comparison against a game where, you know, he, he was very, very good last season and that's the one that most people think of. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think if you'd have thrown one in that Ramsdale debate would have hit the sky. Seriously, it would have, it would have been the only thing we're talking about. And I, I, whether you like one or the other, it doesn't really matter anymore. I do think it's principle-based. I do think it's just it's just back to my 11 midfielder conversation we had last week. It's um, against Brighton. I don't know how many times he had outside of the box. He wasn't quite that game this time, but mm. he likes his keepers to be high and aggressive and be part of the system. And that's the truth. We play with a 3-2... And he drops in there, and he's the fourth guy, right? So, and I think he and he wants his aggressive, high position goalkeeper to play, and I'm afraid that's a bigger priority for him than some of the things that we see when we have a game when we are trapped in our box and Ramsdale flying around the uh, flying around the net. Very spectacular for match of the day, but he wants more than that. He wants to take us to a new place, and uh, this keeper, I'm afraid, has those skill sets to take us to a different place. Yeah. And, and the good news is it's, <clears throat> it's not the big talking point for the game. So mm. I, I think there's never a good situation where you, your keeper is the talking point because it either means you've been battered and he's saved your bacon yeah, or it means he's made a mistake. Um, keepers like referees, I think are good when they're less covered, uh, less discussed. We will not be with Kai Havertz for West Ham. He got a yellow, which means he will be out for the next game. And he'll be a miss. And and we've come to a point now where I think you can write his name in ink as one of the one of the starters. He was really good in this game again. And I you know, I, I really do think there's something to the idea that we went to Anfield last season with players like, well, Rob Holding, you'd prefer not to, obviously, but even Granite Shaka, who leads with big energy right? Fractious, emotional, on edge, combative yeah. energy. And we went to Anfield this season with guys like Rice and and Havertz, whose intensity is more of a quiet intensity. Uh, sometimes Havertz is <laughs> too quiet, but, but there's a maturity about that. And I think Havertz had a really good, without doing anything, I, you know, I do not want to be in this position where every time Havertz just strolls around the pitch and doesn't make a clear error, he's, he's a star. But I thought he gave us comfort. I thought he he was good in the in the duels, and you could see the maturity in this team. And I think that Rice Odegaard Havertz midfield is excellent, and they all have sort of a composure about them in the way they approach the game. And uh, it it looks like also the combination of qualities Odegaard, you know, sort of silky technical. Rice obviously cover every blade of grass, do everything, and and Havertz. Good in the duels, height, physicality, a little bit of box presence and composure. I, I thought it was a good game for him, and the midfield overall looks really well balanced. <clears throat> yeah, I thought, I agree. Yeah, I think the balance is looking nice, and Odegaard is now able to float a bit more and, and go and get the ball, and I think that suits his personality. He's very ball dominant. I do think sometimes he's so keen to get on it that sometimes he can find himself facing his own goal a bit too much, and he can get yeah. robbed. He can get robbed. Mm. That's one for him to focus on. You know, 
if you don't have to to shake it around the corner, you can just bounce it off and then get it back next time. So he can get snuck up on on occasions. But I love the fact that he, the more touches he has, the better for me because he's just a whiz. He just passes that ball beautifully. Sometimes Havertz can look disconnected because you look at Rice and you look at Odegaard and they are just all over the ball. And Havertz is the other guy. So when he doesn't have a big chance miss in our minds, you think, oh, what's he actually done today? But he is part of the exit plan. He is part of the group. He does give support line running, and he's very, very smart in his movement and how he supports people under stress on the ball, and he's a good bounce board for them. So he's developing a role in this team, which allows more, much good flow and continuity. I, I feel of his recent games, you know I'm one of his big fans, I felt he was slightly below his better performances, only by a fraction, only by a fraction, because I just wanted him to get a, a chance, a, a run-through chance, and it didn't really happen. And so you don't mind, if you sacrifice him slightly deeper, you want to see him higher. So did he hit the box with his normal authority? I, I'd like to see a little bit more box presence from him, given the fact that Odegaard was doing a lot of the deeper floating stuff. But we are talking 0.2 percentile worth of concern you know, I, he's gone to that ground. Four or five weeks ago, we weren't picking him versus City. Do you know what I mean? So uh, whenever it was, and not many of us, potentially many people listening, wouldn't have picked him for this day. Would have said it's too hot. Can we get Thomas Party back to go party rice? You know, and um, so, yeah, it's uh, a big step forward for him. I think he's, uh, he's a, such a promising player for me. Such a promising player. Yeah. I think a last thing we can focus on from a just player standpoint before we go big picture uh, again is the subs. I watched the last bit of this game again, and I really read it wrong in the instant reaction. So I'm glad. Yeah, I I, I kind of dismissed Eddie's performance. I think he gave us good energy. I mean, one of the things mm. when Eddie has a bad sub performance, he just doesn't run enough. He doesn't yeah. come on with the intensity. I think he matched the intensity of the game well. I wouldn't say he was the cleanest in his execution, but his intensity and his his willingness to contest, you know, his duels and fight for the ball was really important and, and helped to see out that game. So I, I think that was positive. Troussard gave us a measure of control. There was one slightly frustrating moment where, um, we, we brought the ball forward with Troussard. It was on the counter attack and it was, it, it's funny. So right before the five V two, right. Whereas Zinchenko slips, they take it up and, and, uh, Trent misses the, the, Big chance hits the bar. We had a counterattack um, from their corner. So Harvey Elliott shoots. It's deflected off Gabriel. They get a corner. From their corner, we get a really good counterattack. And it comes to Troussard, and he's got options, and he just delays, and he delays, and nothing really comes from it. Um, and then we wind up getting a corner when the ball deflects out for our corner, and that leads to their big chance. So it was, yeah. it was a tale of two corners, right? We had a counterattack. We didn't convert. They had a counterattack. They didn't convert, thankfully. I thought he had a fine performance, but Smith Rowe doesn't come on. Nelson doesn't come on. You look at what Liverpool had that they brought on. Obviously, Darwin Nunez, a very talented, if mercurial kind of player that comes on for yeah. them. And I can understand if you're Mikel Arteta being between two minds, wanting to go win it at Anfield, but certainly, certainly not wanting to lose it after what I think is a very good performance and a, a better point for us than for them. But it does, you know, I think raise questions about whether we have enough particularly in the wide positions where Trissard increasingly looks not like a wide player, certainly for that left sided role that Martinelli has. Mm -hmm. And Nelson doesn't really truly seem to be trusted to spell Bukayo Saka in critical situations. So I, I gave the bench a stock falling in the instant reaction, not for poor performance, but for just our, re our reliance on them. You know, our yeah. maybe not having, all the tools we'd like in our tool belt to go and try to win a game like this late. Do you think that's fair? I, uh, yeah, because you want to, you wanted to win, and you weren't sure we had enough. So that's how you walked into the room, right? So, um, and so I wanted. I thought, oh, if we're going to win, it's going to be Saka's going to do it for us. So, I, so he was big in my mind. Does that mean? Mm. I always think when these games, you walk into a room with something. You you walk into a room with something. And and you, and you leave with something else, right? So um, I think it's very important. It's unique to you, individual to you. If I look at the substitutes, um, I'm I thought Eddie 
gave one of his best sub performances. <laughs> and I look when I look yeah. at him, I always judge him by how he's moving. I couldn't believe it because when he comes off the bench, mate, trust me, I've, I've, the amount of times I wanted to sub sub him, yeah, honestly, he just like takes a while to get his second win. But I thought he was sharp. I thought he was aggressive. At the moment when we needed him, he he brought it, and he just looked really good at pressing them down. He made one tackle the edge of our area. I've never seen him do that before. You know, not like that. You know, got there, right side, great tackle. So I thought he gave the team something. And Trossard was just a very intelligent ball player. But then yeah, I thought he carried one, I think there's one part of the game in it when he carried out the pitch, I think he's on his own against four or five and got a corner out of it. And that sort of thing is just like a godsend to the rest of the team when you're under the pump a little bit. You know, a godsend. And much like the sack of this conversation you had earlier, he gets us out of jail so many times we can always play to him. And I thought Trossard was really good at his availability. Uh, some of his corners weren't great, but his availability was really, really good. And so I was quite pleased with those two. Um, when we talk about Nelson and, and Smith Rowe, I do think at the moment they're not quite at this level yet, you know. Um, and Nelson, for me, it's a discussion to have. We've re signed him. Have we re signed him to be a finisher for this team in some games? Or have we re signed him to protect his body for a sale? We're going to find out really, really quickly. Same for Smith Rowe. Same for Eddie. We're going to find out what a plan is. Then we'll know why the boys' contracts were given. Keep yours an interesting one. I think, could he have come on in this game? I think it would have sent a message to say we're worried. And I didn't think that was the right message to send. I was close to writing the key of your tweet needs to come on. But I think if we'd have scored, he'd have come on. But it would have been a back five. He would have come on as a, you know, and Shinchenko would have gone into like a wing back position. Do you see what I mean? I think it would have been to protect a game rather than at 1-1 one, one where, where we we were still in it. So um, people have different views on him. I want to like him. I need to like him because he's going to play. He's going to play because we've only got five defenders, so he's going to play. And we need to like him. We need to give him support. Whether he stays at this club, I have my doubts. You know, um, I do, just based on rumours. So um, I have my doubts whether he stays at this club past the summer. But right now, I, I need to like him because I think he's an important resource. We can't just keep playing the same players all the time. They will break down. I don't see anything else we could have done. Georgina's only just back from a foot injury. Mm-hmm. And then he's only just back from a hamstring injury. And then we're, we're bereft a little bit because we've got so many, we've got so many injuries, really. So you just have to... So your stock falling is, is right. But what you're really saying is, we need some additions in this group, don't we? Or people back to health. And suddenly that bench gives us options, like it did for City at home, when I think we won it from the bench. I hope we use some of those players the next time we face Liverpool in the FA Cup. I don't want to give too much away, because a couple weeks after that, we play them for real in the Premier League. They may not have Mohamed Salah. We'll never have a better chance, I think, to to win a game against Liverpool that could become really, really important in a title race that Manchester City will almost certainly fight their way back into as well. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, that that's going to be a critical moment. I think now we turn to the business that has to be done. West Ham at home, Fulham away. Then you have a nice, long 20-day layoff until we play in the Premier League again. Um, and you have the chance to strengthen if if we can do that and if we plan to do that. I, I think West Ham's an interesting one because th- they've been a bit of a pain in our ass. Yeah. For Mikel? A good side. I think, well, and Moyes, you know, Mikel has a thing with Moyes, right? Um, played for him, obviously, was an important part of his career. This is why football's crazy, too. I think Declan Rice might be the best player in the Premier League. He might. You know, Holland probably is. But if you want to make an argument for Declan Rice, I'd be willing to listen to it, him or Saliba, frankly. Declan Rice has been absolutely transformative for Arsenal. He is the best signing I have seen us make since... I I literally... I shudder to, to name a name because it, it could be a bad one, but he's up there as good as any signing we have ever made since I've been supporting the club. Um, I mean, Thierry Henry, <laughs> Dennis Bergkamp, you know, <laughs> Robert Pires, Patrick Vieira. There's there's a few that I probably should, should, should throw in there. Um, 
But then you look at West Ham, and they're doing better this season without him. And that's why football is crazy. Football is crazy, right? You can you can make the best yep. signing in your club's history, and it can propel you to potentially win a title. And then the, the team that moved on from him can find a way to be better somehow. So football is crazy like that. When you look at these next two games, you know, we're not going to have Kai Havertz for West Ham. You absolutely positively cannot afford to drop any points here. You have to win both of these games and go into this break at the top of the table. What's your thought about how we approach these and maybe the good fortune of the layoff we have between them, playing on the 28th, playing on the 31st. There are a lot of teams that would kill for the schedule, the the, the fixture timing that we've uh, gotten ourselves into with this with this holiday program. Yeah, the fixture timing is good. And also the distance traveling is not big, right? We're in London, so that's great. Yep. Then we have Liverpool on the 7th. Then we have a break because we're a little mid-season break off to Dubai and back after thereafter. So, um, yeah, West Ham took their £100 million. They nicked an extra £20 million off us, to be honest. I felt he's an £85 million pound player, but I'm not great with numbers. And they got the extra, got to make it 105 <laughs> Feels cheap today, doesn't it? 105 mm-hmm. Um but they used that money wisely. They bought in Ward Prowse, they bought in Kudos, they bought in Edson Alvarez, and they, they used We scouted that Kudos. We liked him. Yeah, a we lot. liked him. Yeah. And he, and he's really hit that team now. And he's Michael Antonio's got hamstrings made of cheese, so he's finally out of the team. And and they've got Jared Bowen punching down the middle. And with Kudos and Paqueta all around him, with James Ward Prowse punching up behind, you know, and flicking the ball second phase into the box, clipping it in the channels, and running over to take corners. And so they've got they've got a team now that's well constructed. And they use their money really, really well. And I think they'll go again. I think they will buy another centre forward, you know, and um, potentially Eddie. You never know. Potentially they will buy another centre forward. They've got money. They've got good revenues. They've got bigger attendance than us. I wouldn't, you know, that sounds positive after just beating Manchester United. But when they went to Anfield in a the week, they didn't try a leg. Right? They didn't try a mm-hmm. leg. And Manchester United at home a few days later, they were they were a different team. It wasn't a fantastic game. They were a different team. So they're, they're, a, they're a hard team to, to work out. They're quite inconsistent. But I think they're, they're a true Premier League team now. will not be skirting towards the bottom of the table like they have done in recent years. They seem to have got their recruitment much better. They seem to be looking at players that some of the top teams don't want to try to take the gamble on and they become that step club and then they seem to be selling quite well and they will sell quite well going forward. So yeah, they're well positioned. They're well positioned and we're going to have to be on it, mate, to beat them. Definitely. And if I'm the team, sorry, Elliot, just to chop you, Declan Rice can't, he, I've, all his teammates need to play well on this day. We don't want it. West Ham to come into our house with 100 million quid in our back pocket, and then come and beat us with Declan Rice in our team in a proper game, not in a League Cup game, in a proper game. Mm. And we got a we got to back him up because he's been carrying us on his back for a while in some of the key moments of the season. So we need to make sure we back him up. That's my team. Talk to the players, mate. Do the job for him. They're a weird team. They're currently above Newcastle United, Brighton, Chelsea, above all those teams in the league. They sit just behind Manchester City. They're on a plus one goal difference. They're in a negative expected goal difference. Mm. They're fourth or fifth from bottom defensively in expected goals allowed, and they're lower mid-table in expected goals for. So like the underlying metrics would tell you they're not great. Their table position tells you they're good. When I watch them, they seem a perfectly cromulent top half of the table team. They played Liverpool and City already. In both games, they got absolutely smoked. So, you know, that's just a little context, just a little something to look at. So we got to go win those games. Uh, Fulham, we obviously have a wrong to right with the draw at home, which is the the one inexcusable result slash performance of the season. Well, the perform- anyway, we got to write that wrong. Let's just put it that way. Um, I'll be curious to see what we do with Kai Havertz out. Do we just go right to Jorginho plus Rice? Um, or do we give Smith Rowe a run out? You know, do we, do we try something? Um, okay, so... Let's just wrap it up with this, Clive. This is the second season in a row we find ourselves top at Christmas. Six of the last 10 teams top at Christmas have won the title. We obviously didn't do it last season. I think we're in a stronger position this season. But I think we should take a minute to just appreciate the fact that we are now two seasons running the best team in the league at Christmas time. We're one point off where we were last season. I think we're a better team than we are last season, even if we haven't fully quote unquote clicked in attack. I just, I love where we are right now. I am enjoying it. We have Declan Rice, which is, an experience that's far surpassed my my every expectation or hope or dream. How do you feel about Arsenal right now as we head into Christmas, top of the table again? 
Yeah, I, I like this. I like this type of <laughs> Arsenal team. Um, mm. We've seen some peaks and troughs in form. We've seen a big peak from Jesus recently. I thought he was a bit flat against Liverpool. We've seen some big peaks from Odegaard. He's coming back a little bit in and out in this in the recent game. So we've seen in and out from, from, from Saka, who's he's productivity is massive for us all season which is great goals and assists and while we're learning about bringing Havertz in and seeing Odegaard in new roles seeing Rice in the 8 seeing him in the 6 there's been a couple of constants in our centre backs even our goalkeeper has been a debate for us you know our left back situation has changed on occasions injuries to our right back we've got major long term injuries in behind and when you put that all together and we're sitting there top of the league I think it's exciting whereas last year when we played we won 12 out of the first 14 games drew one lost one at Old Trafford which we know we should never have lost basically it couldn't get much better than that and we all knew it we all knew this was brilliant this is unbelievable this is 100 point basis oh my goodness we're doing this now and we know there's so much more to come there's so much more there's so many people that are not quite at it yet and while they're not at it, their their floor games is enough to win, you know, and um, or win the points we need to win for this season. So I'm really hopeful that we're going to find more people are going to find form where it really, really matters. And I am I am very much interested, as you know, I am in how we want to supplement the squad. And I do think sales is a key thing we need to talk about because our financial fair play position is telling me we need to think about it. So that's going to be such an interesting period coming up. We may not be ready to genuinely appreciate that this team could win a European and domestic double. It sounds almost silly to say it. We've never won the European Mm. Cup. But we're top of the best league in the world, playing the best in that league with maybe the best team. It's not crazy. I hope the club does whatever they can. I understand FFP. I understand we have to have some considerations. I hope they do whatever they can in January to try to reinforce our ability to go do those things. Because you never know when you're going to get a chance to have the most historic season in your club's history. We may have that chance. We're halfway to being there in the league, and we're now about to return to the knockout rounds of the Champions League for the first time in six years, and looking like, not a favorite, certainly, but one of the four that you'd probably have on the list of teams that could go win it. So, Let's let's take that seriously and reinforce. I'm excited for yeah. where this is going. Once again, I wish everybody who's celebrating a merry slash happy Christmas. And if you're not celebrating, I still wish you a wonderful uh, happy time of the year as we are top of the table. And we will certainly um, hope to see you over on Patreon if you can be over there where we will be doing, I think, a rewatch of the Liverpool game along with a lot of things this week. Um, and of course, in January, all the scouting videos, which are always fun. So if you want to be there, great. But if not, if not, for whatever reason, we're just happy that you're here at all. Clive's on Twitter, Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith. You can me on Twitter. Yank, and we love you. We will talk to you after Arsenal 10, West Ham nil.